Someone needs to throw another log on? All right, let's do that. My name is Coach Tom Sisolak. I'm the founder, creator of this unique project. This was back in November of 2007, and we have been doing this each year. Somebody today will actually plant tree number 15,000. As of last year, the 12th year, we planted 14,700. And in the buckets over here, which I'll explain in a minute, there are 100 seeds in each bucket. We have 10 buckets. Then there also are some additional plastic Ziploc bags that have 100 additional seeds, which are very tiny. They include some bald cypress, some basswood, and all you need to do is use a screwdriver, which I'll show you in a short while, compared to the specially designed tools that I invented almost four, de 40, four decades ago. My son uh, handcrafted, welded them. They work very well. They'll actually go through about three to four inches of frost, which I think the frost has left with this last five or six days of warm weather. And we're going to have a short seminar. I'll speak first. Then my good friend Joseph Standing Bear, Native American Ojibwa Indian, will speak. And then our forester, Mike Collins, will go through some additional information for all of you. But first of all, thank you for volunteering today. We got a great crowd. What number did you come up with? Uh, I Maybe think be somewhere around 60 now. Very good. Outstanding. Thank you. Give yourself a round of applause for being here. <laughs> We've been here at the Scout Cabin. This is our third year. The first 10 years were based out of the Methodist Church. And this is kind of a more appropriate location. You can head out into the woods to the south and also to the north. Come back here if you get cold or you can warm up in your vehicles. Michael will explain the uh, planting sites for the teams. And if uh, some folks would like to plant just the smaller seeds, we actually could plant up to 2,500 trees today. I've counted out and sorted every one of the seeds that go into the selection to make the tree planting. I usually collect between 5,000, 10,000 seeds during the months of September, October, November, and then I go through and sort each one, discard the ones that are not of the best quality. So the percentage that sprout hopefully have increased by that selection process. And the seeds that we plant today are quite numerous. On the table up here, the display table, are about pretty close to 30 different varieties. You're free to take a look before you head out or after you come back. And today we're going to plant red oak, burr oak, maybe you recognize some of these names, black oak, round oak. There's over 250 varieties of oak trees. Mike has two sophisticated college as well as graduate degrees in forestry and trees. So all of your hundreds of questions, he's the man with all the answers. So you can talk to him during and afterwards. Graduated from University of Wisconsin, graduate school as well. Uh, U of I for University of Illinois for graduate school. We're going to plant black walnut, shagbark hickory, Ohio buckeye, the little round guys up here, butternut, which is similar to a black walnut, bald cypress, which is a pine tree that actually loses all of its needles now and has no needles during the winter. And then it regenerates a new full crop of needles in the spring. Red cedar, which is a really tiny seed, Black locust, which is even smaller. Actually grows in a little pod on the tree. So this little pod, there are two, four, six, seven seeds left. A few of them already have fell out. So each little tiny seed 
grows a beautiful black locust tree, which is a very hard wood and very tiny compared to some of the other seeds. The largest one over there is the Osage orange, and inside that pod are hundreds of smaller seeds. The Native American Indians love the Osage orange because it's a very hard wood, but it's also very springy, so that's what they use to make a lot of the bows. It springs back and goes back to its normal position. We're also going to plant ironwood. There's a few ironwood trees in Riverside. And by its name, it's a very, very hard wood. In fact, carpenters usually can't pound a nail through the wood. So they usually have to drill a hole first, put the nail in the hole, and then pound it, whatever they're building. And then also basswood, hazelnut, very sought after by the squirrels. They usually eat the hazelnut, like hazelnut coffee. They usually eat the hazelnut before it even falls off the tree. And then a new one we started last year, which I know Mike was very uh, happy that we're planting this tree, our pecan. So that's some of the varieties that we're going to plant today. I'll let Joel hang on to that one. <clears throat> particular wafer of wood was cut by Mike and his crew. Unfortunately, this bur oak tree was damaged in a storm, and he cut this down actually 10 years ago already. And he counted all the rings. Each ring signifies one year of growth. Mike counted, and I even verified it, counted again. 101 years old for this small wafer of bur oak. So you can see that's not very large, is it? But it's still 101 years old. So the seeds you plant today, when you pick the right location, a perfect spot that you want to plant these seeds, keep in mind that these trees will be here in Riverside, hopefully without any storms or disease. They'll actually continue living for 100, 200, maybe 300 years here in the village. Right outside the scout cabin here, to my left, is a northern red oak, which is huge in comparison to this size as like your standard to gauge. I'm estimating that northern red oak, which also grows very slow, could be 400 years old. So make sure you take a look at that tree when you leave the cabin. That tree obviously has been here for many, many years, and Joseph... His great-great-great-grandparents lived in Riverside in this area. He's Ojibwa Indian from northern Minnesota. Riverside, as I learned from one of his good friends who sadly recently passed away, Miles Stoddard, was a professor who studied many of the historical aspects of the Native American Indians in what we call the United States. And he explained that through his research, Riverside was actually, no problem, it's one of the planting tools. Riverside was one of the largest villages of Native Americans in the entire Des Plaines Valley, Des Plaines River Valley area. This time of the year, several families would come together, build their winter lodges. So this is very historic, not only for Riverside itself, 150 years, but also Native American history. Mike, I'll pass, pass this photograph around. You can take a look at it. This is actually a photograph taken around, 19, or me, around 1850, and I found this photograph up in Hayward, Wisconsin. This is depicting the virgin timber, which was here in America when all of the Native American Indians lived in this area, this nation, for thousands of years. This is a white pine tree, which is approximately 3,000 years old. And the men cutting this tree are from either the Scandinavian Nordic countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland, or in Europe, Czechoslovakia, Germany. 
They came to America to harvest the wood. And when they're cutting these ancient trees, this one about 3,000 years old, there literally were millions of these trees, northern Wisconsin, northern Michigan, Minnesota, Canada. And sadly, they wanted the wood because it was the only building product in America, 1700s, 1800s. Sadly, they thought by cutting these trees, they would grow back in a couple years. But it actually took about 3,000 years for this tree. So take a look at that photograph. I'll hand it around. Also, before you leave, if you could fill out the information card with your name, email, we can keep in contact on future events. When you return from planting, we'll have a hot chili dinner and some hot chicken noodle soup, hot coffee, hot chocolate. Please join us. I would like to uh, give you a short demonstration on how to use some of the tools, the ones that are over here, as well as this trusty screwdriver. This particular tool is stainless steel, fairly heavy, so be careful. The point is not that sharp, but it is rounded. And this tool actually works extremely well for planting tree seeds. I invented this, as I said, about four decades ago. My son welded them, and I've used a lot of different tree planting tools. This one is making such a small hole, and the seed goes to the bottom of the hole, then you fill it with dirt, go on to the next location. The other tools I've used left too much air. The hole wasn't completely filled. Sometimes it tore up too much of the soil. And as a result, the little seedlings, or the seeds themselves, then were exposed to too much hot weather and didn't germinate, didn't grow. So this tool obviously can go down quite deep, but you only want to go about three to four inches. You look at the seed, this is a black walnut with the casing still on it and the shell inside there and the nuts inside. So whatever the diameter of the seed is, so this is about an inch and a half, two inches, only want to make the hole two to three times the diameter. So for a black walnut, maybe six inches, five inches. For this little burr oak, which is about an inch, you only have to make a hole about three to four inches. The reason is that inside this shell is actually the acorn. The acorn contains the carbohydrate energy and the DNA to grow the tree. So the carbohydrate energy is not that much. So if you planted this bur oak, 12 inches or more, there's not enough energy to push through the sprout of the tree all the way through that depth of soil. And then when it gets to the top, obviously then the DNA takes over, grows the tree. So take the tool and just find a good spot in the woods, brush away the leaves, pine needles. The ground will still be soft because the pine needles leaves kept it warm. So find a good spot, brush away the leaves and needles. Then just lean on the tool, push it down for the black walnut, the big one, you're going to have to take this tool and kind of round out the hole a little bigger. And then take the walnut, push it to the bottom of the hole. Then just cover it up, go on to the next one. For the uh, burr oak, once again, this one you don't have to round out the hole. So just put it in the ground, push it down three or four inches only. You might want to twist it to bring it out. You want to put that one in the hole? Push it down in there. Good, now cover the hole up with dirt. Pack it down a little bit. 
Very good. Let's give him a hand for planting that bur oak. Okay, those folks that take the uh, Ziploc baggie of the really tiny seeds, all you have to do is use a trusty screwdriver, which I have a whole collection of them over here. This seed is about eighth of an inch, so these go in maybe an inch, maybe an inch and a half. So just take the screwdriver, make a little tiny hole. You wanna put that one in there? Find that hole right there. Drop it in there, cover it up. Good. Let's give him a hand for planting that red cedar. So these are a little more delicate. Be careful, you don't want to open up the Ziploc baggie and have 100 seeds go all over the woods. When you come back, obviously you can wash your hands in the boys' bathroom, girls' bathroom. Any questions on this information so far? There's no real strategy. You will see in the woods that there are certain groves, uh -huh. and mainly because like when this northern red oak drops its acorns, then it will actually spread more red oak next to it. That's why right here by the scout cabin, I found this a huge red oak here, which is about 400 years old. There's one in this corner right above my blue pickup truck. It's about 250 years old. There's a double northern red oak right by the doorway, and there are a few others. So that kind of starts certain groves of trees just by when they drop their own seeds. There are certain trees like black walnut and even a few others that, Mike, what's the chemical that's in the black walnut that kind of uh, prevents weeds and things from growing? Jutland. Jutland. There's a chemical within the black walnut seeds and the tree itself, Jetlin, if I pronounced it right, which actually prevents weeds and other things from growing underneath black walnut trees. Also, the black walnut tree, the Jetlin, the nut, which are great for Christmas cookies and cake and everything, are actually poisonous for horses. If somebody would intentionally give a horse a black walnut nut, it will die in 24 hours. If horses walk on black walnut shells in their corral, they'll die in about three days. So we're not allergic to it. Other animals, like a horse, knows not to eat a black walnut. It's only if somebody would either mistakenly or intentionally put that in their feed. So certain trees have certain chemicals which won't allow others to grow nearby. Any other questions right now? Okay, I'd like to introduce Joseph Standing Bear. You guys want to sit down so you can hear? Joseph, as I said earlier, is Native American Indian, Ojibwa Indian Nation, grew up in northern Minnesota. He's also the founder, creator of very fantastic educational organization called Midwest Soaring. You can look it up on his website. And they are very dedicated towards educating about Native American Indian culture. They also work to pre preserving land, which were burial grounds or villages. So those lands are not turned into shopping malls or housing developments. And he's going to speak about the uh, sacredness of what we call Indian gardens and also some other fantastic things about Native American Indian culture. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Joseph. I'm real happy to see <clears throat> the amount of people here today. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> My foundation has saved over 2,000 acres of the state, and we're very proud to do that. And these are mainly uh, sacred sites, burial sites. And uh, I'm really happy to see the amount of kids here today. It's really, really important that you brought them. Uh, we must protect the environment, and that's really 
Really important. Um, I was one of those people that was in North Dakota with the DAPL, save the oil, I mean, prevent the oil. You know, and uh, the dedication of people who want to protect this world is growing. And I think it's really, really important that you guys realize how fragile the environment is. <clears throat> uh, Tom here, I want to give Tom a hand here. 15,000 trees, that's a lot of trees. Thank you. And I also want to give Mike a hand because he takes a really interest in making sure the Riverside stays as beautiful as it is. And I don't know if you guys really appreciate how beautiful it really is. Uh, it's not like most uh, subdivisions which aren't planned as well. This is planned to be this way. Uh, our people travel the waterways. <clears throat> our burial grounds are nearby. And we knew the beauty of the water. Uh, we had no toxic things that we ever had. We didn't have landfills. Uh, and uh, I really want to stress, you guys are the solution for the future. We have to stop using plastics. Uh, there was a, uh, recently there was a biologist, <clears throat> with a bunch of fish that washed up on the shore and some whales, and he cut them open, the birds, and their bodies were entirely impacted with plastics. Uh, what happens is plastic, in fact, even uh, recently in, in Mariana's Trench, which is the deepest, deepest trench in the ocean, they're finding plastic even way down there. So even you guys like eating clams and you know, those kind of little animals, they're eating all these little particles, and that's becoming their body. And when you eat that, you're going to get sick. Now, I don't know if you guys are aware of as I am, but uh, these cancers are spreading rapidly, and we have more and more. You know, I want to prevent these little guys from having that kind of problem. And we're the solution. We need uh, government officials and people that listen and do what we want. And uh, I'm not a Democrat. I'm not a Republican. I'm a water person. I'm for the earth. You know, so I well, wish that you guys stand up for that. And, uh, you know, when Tom is doing something or people like that, we have a chance to show these kids respect. Uh, they need that. They need to know that value of that word, respect, recycle, which is really important, and reverence, reverence to the all. Uh, you know, there's, Tom and I were talking earlier about some beavers that have floated down, and they're in the area here, and uh, how they uh, have a habit of gnawing on some of the trees. That's, that's what they do to stay alive, you know, and um, uh, it's really important to know that the world has a lot of variety and diversity. And every single plant and animal has a purpose. Only thing is, we're not that smart to understand what that purpose is. And we're not very careful in protecting their lives and protecting their habitats. We need to be. Because when they disappear, we'll disappear. So with that, I want to not talk too much. I might have got some things to say, but I just uh, encourage you to keep on teaching and keep on doing. Uh, value the outside. Value what you have here and around the world. Uh, really, really important thing, guys. Thank you, Joseph. <laughs> Joseph organizes a wonderful powwow Native American Indian cultural celebration every September in the Naperville area. So if you go to his website, you can find out about next year's event. It's really fantastic, wonderful. Mike Collins. Our Riverside Forester. <laughs> Here's the Tom. This is what, 15 years you said now? This is 13. 13 oh, lucky 13. 15,000 trees 15, today. 15,000 trees. Uh, you know, hats off to you, my friend. You have done an amazing job here, and it's great to be gathered today. Joseph, I echo your sentiments and really appreciate what you're saying about the environment. Uh, I think this is just an amazing event. And all these wonderful arborists and environmentalists growing up, it's great to have you all here today. I really appreciate you all coming out. Um, you know, I was just curious as a show of hands, how many of you are from Riverside proper? Just curious. And, and those of you who are not, welcome. We love having you here today. Um, you know, Riverside to me is a very special place to work as a forester. It's a bit like working in a piece of art. Uh, Frederick Lowenstedt's design, the combination of these wonderful green spaces and natural areas along with our parks, common areas, the parkways. I mean, to me, this is a premier job as a forester, and I really enjoy working with all of you to protect our trees and care for our community. Uh, this is really a sense of community, and that's what it's about. Uh, you know, and I really appreciate you and coming out today 
Uh, this is probably a little bit of preaching to the choir if you're spending your Saturday uh, planting seeds in the cold, right? But, um, you know, trees bring so much to our lives in the way of benefits. You know, as a forester, I've dedicated myself to maintaining these trees to provide these benefits to all of you. Um, there's so many different benefits and ways that trees enrich our lives, whether socially, uh, you know, just the fact that the presence of more trees helps to reduce crime. Uh, there's been research and studies that have shown that children in classrooms who have open windows to green space actually perform better on testing, which to me, you know, the proof's in the pudding with this research. It all comes down to science. Uh, but also then there's quite a few economic benefits. Trees do raise your property value. Uh, you know, they bring something to your parcel of land and it behooves you and all of us to better maintain these trees to maximize these benefits, whether helping to shade your home and reduce cooling costs, um, you know, helping to intercept pollutants, environmental benefits. Uh, really, all of these things are so important to our way of life and it's great to see such a wonderful turnout today. Give yourselves a round of applause. I really appreciate you coming out. I don't want to hold you captive too long because I can feel the energy in the room. Uh, we're ready, right? We're ready to plant some trees. Um, I did want to share with you actually a project that I've started that um, you know, is almost inspired directly from Tom and I's collaborations uh, about, well, in 2017, I collected uh, white oak acorns from around the river. Um, and this has become a project that I refer to as the Worth Project. It's the White Oak Riverside Tree Heritage Project. So what we're doing here is preserving the genetic legacy of a lot of these pre-settlement white oaks that have grown in our community and co-evolved on the riverbanks of Riverside. Uh, what I've done is provided these acorns to a local nursery, which will now grow on these trees to a two-inch size, and then I'll come back and replant them under the mature trees the idea here being is that white oaks are particularly well adapted compared to most other oaks to grow in shade. So before we start seeing some of these trees pass, I think it's important to get the next generation going and keeping Riverside green for people to enjoy in the future, right? Yeah. Yeah, there you go. That's the spirit. Oh, this is such a great group. So uh, with that, I would mention that we have these maps and actually we're overwhelmed by the response today and you all coming out. I guess we would thank Linda Sandusky for throwing it on the exchange. Did all of you hear it on, on the exchange? Is that uh, how you came about this? Maybe. How, how many scouts? Cub scouts, Girl Scouts, Brownie oh, Scouts, right Boy Scouts? Very good. Fantastic. Well, either way, I appreciate that the word's gotten out. It's great to have you all here. Um, we do have these handouts. I have 12 of them. There's 10 sites, and obviously, as groups, you probably outnumber those sites. So I would encourage you to partner up as a team with maybe some neighbors you know, or maybe get to know some strangers and keep that feeling of community alive here. Um, but anyway, there are maps that denote numbers for different sites. The buckets are labeled accordingly. Uh, these sites have been picked as upland sites or lowland sites, and Tom has hand-selected these seeds for the appropriate location to ensure some success. So, um, you know, when you're going out there, uh, you know, just rule of thumb, I'd encourage you to stay away from the turf grass areas and plant along the natural areas in the riverbank where there's forest and leaf cover. Um, and then also there's three additional sites around the Swan Pond area. Um, Swan, and the Swan Pond area plant on the hillside, not where we do our sledding, of course, as Mike said. Don't plant any tree seeds where there's lawn mowing. Plant in the woods, the rough area. And uh, since we have so many volunteers here today, Mike has 10 sites, as he mentioned. But we will, if folks would like to plant some of the miniature little seeds, we can plant uh, 2,500 seeds if we have groups split up to take the 10 buckets as well as the additional tiny little seed packages. What do you guys think? You think we can handle 2,500 trees today? Yeah. All right, there you go. That's the spirit. And somebody in here will plant tree number 15,000. And all of you scouts, when you're a little older, make sure you come back to Riverside, check to see how your trees are growing. 
They'll be here for 200, 300, hopefully longer. Any questions somebody might have for Mike? At the Actually, moment? one suggestion that I think is a great suggestion is we could put one map out there if you'd like to take a digital picture. Um, that way you have something with you um, since we only have 12. So I will leave that one at the top of the mantle here. Put it on the table here. Yeah, there you go. Good, good idea, Tom. Don't burn yourself in the process. <laughs> um, but we do have some hard copies, but I think the digital idea is a great idea. Thanks, Kathy, wherever you went. Um, so anyway, you know, thanks again for coming out. It's very meaningful to me uh, to see such a great turnout and that we're moving forward together to help preserve our urban forests. So thank you very much. It means a lot. Trees are uh, very uh, pretty. They provide shade. They, they're nice to look at, and uh, they're uh, a deep part of the history of this town, and it means a lot to have uh, very well-wooded areas and uh, um, have that kind of shelter. The reason we came out here today was uh, just wanted to get outside with the kids and uh, help plant some trees. Uh, it's a good cause, and uh, it was fun. I mean, it looks nice. It's good for the environment. Um, you know, probably good for nature and all the animals that are around. So, uh, yeah, it means a lot to have my kids here. They get to learn about nature and the importance of uh, you know, environment, planting trees, and uh, yeah. We're really excited actually because um, we were given the ash tree seeds and we were told that, I mean recently we've had to cut down 85 million ash trees in the area because of the ash borer and we were told these are the first, first ash trees being planted here and I'm so excited. <laughs> it's really cool and we're, we'll see if the borer gets them or not, we're not sure, so it'll be exciting to see what happens. The trees help with the fauna and the flora and you get more animals coming in which help with the environment and you get oxygen in the air which I mean there's roads all over here and the air we breathe will be cleaner and better for us, we'll be healthier overall, just it's really important, trees are amazing. So my role with the Village of Riverside is to help take care and preserve, maintain our urban trees within the village. Uh, today would be a great example of working towards natural regeneration of trees in our woodlands. It's also an excellent opportunity to en engage with our community uh, to promote trees and also partner with our residents uh, to plant trees or at least seeds that will become into trees within the future. Um, you know, really a lot of it is environmental awareness and education as well. I see that as a very large role in an urban forester's uh, uh, you know, approach to getting community engagement and, and buy-in in terms of its trees and landscape. Uh, you know, ultimately, I think my big goal is to maintain and preserve trees to maximize benefits for the village of Riverside and the residents that live here. Uh, and then also there's a component of uh, social benefits where people are just better off uh, aesthetically, uh, you know, it also helps to uh, improve and uh, improve our property values and the economic values within the village. Uh, really maximizing those benefits are a big goal of mine as a village forester. To me, it just shows how wonderful Riverside is and, and that there are quite a few people within this village that care about their urban trees as well. Um, you know, it means a lot to me as a forester because uh, you know, for me, I feel very well supported within the community, um, and I also love that residents care about their urban trees. There's very little apathy in the community. People are out there and engaged and volunteering on a, a, you know, a weekly basis here, which is great for me because it lets me know that I work in a village where trees are valued. Very successful 1,000 tree planting project today. Many energetic volunteers, probably 65 maybe 70 and they all have stated they enjoyed being in the woods planting their bucket of a hundred seeds along with the tools that I invented some four decades ago everything seemed to go well they're all enjoying some hot chili some homemade chicken noodle soup some hot coffee hot chocolate sitting next to the warm fireplace inside the scout cabin right along the uh, Des Plaines River 
We also were fortunate to have a special friend, Joseph Standing Bear, Ojibwa Indian, who spoke about the sacredness of Indian gardens, the value and importance of planting trees, keeping the new generation of hardwood trees growing in this area. They're all trees that are native to Riverside, native to the state of Illinois, native to the Great Lakes area. And those are the ones that are greatly needed to be regenerated so we can keep the wildlife properly fed, continue their generation. And we're looking forward to watching these trees grow right here in Riverside along the Des Plaines River. Hope you can join us for next year.